We're uh, continuing in our study of the little book of James, and uh, it's, uh, I've been developing this out of the whole idea that uh, he wants us to have a faith that works. Uh, we saw last week the key verse, faith without works is dead. Uh, you can say that you have faith, and if you're not doing anything based upon that faith, you're all talk, and talk is cheap. It has to be a faith that actually produces change to be genuine, real faith. That's why it says in uh, the Corinthian letter, it says, if anyone is in Christ, they are a new creation. The old is gone, the new has come. Your life is changed when you have real, genuine, biblical faith. You are not the same person you used to be. There is a radical life change. One of those life changes should be our tongue. And so today I want to talk about when you need to control your tongue. Now, as we look into this passage, it starts off with a warning. And the warning is to teachers. Uh, man, that would be me. And we have any other teachers here? Oh yeah, we got teachers here. Warning teachers. Uh, and it may be, you know, every mom should have raised her hand. My mom taught me to tie my shoes, right? I didn't learn that in school. I mean, there's so much I learned from my mom. Dad should have raised their hand. Why? Yeah, I learned how to use all my woodworking tools and things like that from my dad. We're, we're teachers. He's really talking about Christian teachers here, though, in the text. I have to be honest, but there's application everywhere. Not many of you should presume to be teachers. You shouldn't take it upon yourself to be a teacher, my brothers. He's really talking to a Christian family. Because you know that. We who teach will be judged more strictly. There's a reason for that. If I know my subject well enough that I can communicate it effectively for someone else to learn it, then I must really know it. So if I really know it, then I should do it. And if I don't do it, I've condemned myself because I know what I should have done. Later he's going to say, to him who knows to do good and does not do it, to him it is sin. Wow. When I know what I should be doing and I don't do it, to me it is sin. It's called a sin of omission. It's not that I committed a crime. I omitted to do what I should have done. And so it's a sin of omission. He's saying, warning teachers, you will be judged more strictly because you know the subject well enough to teach it. Here's the principle. Talk is cheap. So do as I do, not as I say. The disciples not only heard Jesus, they saw Jesus. He modeled it for them the Christian life. He didn't just tell them, hey, this is what I want you to do, but don't do as I'm doing. Just do as I'm saying. He modeled it. And see, that, that, that's the role of a pastor. He's to be the model for the congregation. That's the role of a Sunday school teacher, to be the model for the student. That's the role of a youth group leader, be the model of the young person. That, that's the role, no matter what you're in, the Bible study facilitator, you're to be the, the model you don't just talk it. You do it. You live it. It's your life. Soon as he said that, I, I like the way he follows that up. We all stumble in many ways. Oh. <laughs> this is really a, a nice way of putting this, you know. It's almost like I really don't want to offend my audience, but what he's saying is, hey, buddy, you've blown it. You're a teacher and you've blown it. You've taught something you didn't do, right? Haven't we as parents? Hey, we told our kids, you do it. And then they said, well, you don't, you don't do this. He said, we've all stumbled in many ways. We, we've all messed up. If anyone is never at fault in what he says, ah, with that tongue, it's talking about our talk. He is a perfect man. Any perfect people here? Didn't think so. So you all admitted to being people who stumble. People who can't control their tongue. Because he says, listen, if, if he can 
If he is never at fault in what he says, he's a perfect man and able to keep his whole body in check, control everything. There are three sets of metaphors in our passage. A lot of people like this passage because it's very picturesque. He's going to give us three sets of metaphors, or six metaphors, and they're grouped in couplets of two each in this passage, and they're all about tongue control. Don't you wish there were a stop button on the tongue? Maybe not on your own, but the other person, you could just reach over and stop it. <laughs> you know what I wish I had? It was a rewind button. You ever had, you ever said, oh, I really wish I could take that one back? In fact, maybe I should back up a few paragraphs. <laughs> you know? We don't have that. But, but he's going to give us three metaphors about controlling the tongue. And they're very revealing. Now, the first one is the domineering tongue. A domineering tongue. And I switch from the New International Version to the New Living Translation to the, se- the second verse here because I just like the way it reads. It says, indeed, we all make mistakes. We all make mistakes. Paul is a little more direct when he talks about it. He says, we're all sinners. I mean, it's just brutally honest. We all make mistakes. If we could control our tongues we would be perfect and could also control ourselves in every other way. I like that. The Greek text really says you'll be able to control your body. Your body. If you can control your tongue, you'll control your whole body. Your whole body. Every other way, all of life, if you could just get control of your tongue. The point is, little things often control bigger things. A little tongue can control my whole body, my whole body and everything I do in life. My tongue, if I can just get control of my tongue. Little things. And so what he says this here, listen, he says, I got a metaphor for you. When we put bits into the mouths of horses to make them obey us, we can turn the whole animal. Now, I'm a city slicker, I admit it. I didn't grow up on the farm. Anybody here grow up on the farm? Anybody here have horses? Yeah, all that stuff. I didn't. So we would go down and visit my cousins in Missouri, and they had horses, and they had a farm. And, and so late in August, we visit one year. My cousins' school started late in August, so they went to school, but they told us we could ride the horses anyway. So my cousin Kermit and I, we decide we'll go get the horses out of the barn, and we're going to ride the horses. And I don't know what I'm doing, and I, I found out later he didn't know what he was doing either. <laughs> We got the bridle on, you know, the bit and all that. It was the saddle that was the problem. We finally get the saddle on, tighten it up. But there's a trick to tightening up the saddle that city slickers don't know. The horse fills its lungs full of air. So when you tighten that up, and then as soon as you get on it, they relax. That thing's not tight around around the center of their bodies. I'm on this horse that my cousin has tightened up. Never giving it the little nudge to get the air out of it. Now that he's running, man, he's got all the air out. And all of a sudden we're turning. And as we're turning, my saddle is sliding off the side of the horse. (laughs) I fall on the ground. Finally, I chase and I catch that horse and, 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 and take it back. My cousin is laughing at me. And he's laughing at me. And his horse decides it's going back to the barn. And so he goes running back to the barn, and he's not authoritative in the control on the reins. And so that horse is going, and he's doing whatever he can to stop, but he's too passive in trying to lead the horse with the bit in its mouth. And the horse goes right into the barn. Well, with him on the horse, the horse has got his head down, but he does it, and he's hitting every beam that the barn as he goes by, and it knocks him completely off the horse. Here's a couple city slickers don't know a thing about horses, right? This passage is written to people who know about horses. Saying you put the bit in their mouth and you take control, you can guide the whole body of that big animal. And if you can get control of your tongue, you can get control of your whole life. Isn't that amazing? This is the word of the Lord. The second metaphor he has is a big, he says, you, you take a ship as an example. Although they are so large and they're driven by strong winds, this is a sailboat ship, they are steered by a very small rudder at the back of the boat 
what, wherever the pilot wants it to go. We were on a cruise. Uh, we were uh, actually doing whale watching up off of the St. Lawrence Seaway on this cruise and uh, beluga whale watching. And, uh, but we were on this huge, massive cruise ship. Uh, and it had side thrusters so it could spin around right in the river, right where it was at. It didn't need tugboat or any of that. It's a massive ship out in the middle of this river watching these beluga whales. And, and uh, the activities director's parents were on board and they were sitting at our table. So the captain of the ship would come down every day to our table and greet everybody at our table. And fi finally he says one day, I want to invite you all up to the bridge. <laughs> that was a point we, we did not miss. I wanted to see that big wheel, you know, that you steer the ship with. Boy, was I in for a surprise. You know how big it was? About that big. It sat on a little desk and you just spun it with your finger. You know why? It had power assist. <laughs> they were moving that huge ship with just that little tiny dial. In fact, if he wanted to, he could just key in what the coordinate he wanted it, and it would do it. He, he didn't even have to really spin anything at all. All right? The whole point is, is the same whether it was back in the ancient world or now. It's the little thing that determines where the big thing goes, what it does. It's the little thing, our mouths, that give us where we're going. He says, likewise, the tongue is a small part of the body, but makes great boasts. You see, both of them have power. The small things, the rudder and the bit, both have the power to direct something huge. Both of them can overcome contrary forces. Uh, the winds, they can go, they, they can, you can sail right into the winds <clears throat> with that rudder going back and forth. You, you can sail against the wind. You, <clears throat> the mouth can do great things is what he's saying. But you need a strong hand to control it. If you don't have a strong hand, an authoritative hand with the horse, he'll do what he wants. <laughs> if you don't set the rudder in the right direction, it's not going to go where you want. It'll go wherever the, the water wants to take you. So the key is, you need Jesus. You need Jesus to take control of your tongue so that he is in control in order to change your whole life. You need Jesus in your life. Jesus said, for out of the over overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. <clears throat> if you have Jesus in your heart, Ephesians chapter 4 says, he dwells in my heart by faith. If I have Jesus in my heart, out of my heart then controls my tongue, my tongue then controls my body, everything changes when Jesus is in control. Everything changes. My whole life changes. My whole world outlook changes. Everything changes when Jesus is in control. Isn't that marvelous? I think it's wonderful. The second thing that he does, he's got another couple of metaphors. <clears throat> he talks about the destructive tongue. He says, consider like a spark. <clears throat> consider what a great forest fire is set on fire by a small spark. I can remember from a child, Smokey the Bear, only you can prevent forest fires. Only, it only takes a spark. Uh, we were on vacation out in Wyoming at Yellowstone Park, and to get there, we had to travel through this scorched earth area. It was all black, smoldering, because a forest fire had come. And the new policy is, because it wasn't man-made, it was from a lightning strike, you let it go. It's part of nature's way of recycling everything. And, and it was like for miles, it was just black scorch. It was a huge part of the park was just all burned because of one little spark. He goes on from here and he says, the tongue is a fire. The tongue is a fire. It only takes a little spark. And what does it do? He goes on and he says, it's a world of evil among the body parts. It corrupts the whole person. 
Fire burns. I'll tell you what, burns hurt. Anybody know that? It burns hurt. The tongue is a fire. <clears throat> it hurts. It hurts. So much so that during World War II, they had posters, something like this. Now, I wasn't around back then. I mean, I wasn't. The war was over before I was born. But I do know that they had this line that went on like this. It says, loose lips sinks ships. Loose lips. Somebody speaking somewhere about where their son was in the military or they're crossing the Atlanta. Enemy spies here in America finding out, positioning themselves in strategic places to find that information, relay it back. You two subs were taking out our ships crossing the Atlantic. Loose lips sinks ships. You get burned. You sink a ship when you're not careful with your tongue. Now, in the political world, the elephant in the room is <laughs> loose lips is going to be the blame for one or the other not being elected as president. Come on, we got one, one party guy that 11 years ago, I don't care, what do they call it? Locker room, banter, they give it a loose lips. A uh, speech that is despicable. And so you say, how in the world as a Christian could I ever vote for a guy like that? On the other side, it wasn't what was said and caught on videotape and brought out at the exact moment to discredit the other person. It's a continuous leak of some hacker putting out emails and it's like the Wizard of Oz at the end when the wizard pulls back the screen, and you see what's really back there? <clears throat> We've got confirmation after confirmation of lying and corruption. I mean, what, what, look at my two choices. On the surface, we got loose lips that sink ships. That's what's going on. They're, they're going down. It depends on what party you really are for, whether you're blaming the other side. Look at their loose lips. Look at their loose lips. So listen, if somebody had controlled their lips, they'd have this thing sealed in one. Isn't that true? That's true. So what do we do? This really puts us as Christians at a dilemma. <clears throat> we got people at the top of the ticket that nobody trusts. I should say relatively nobody trusts. So there are some who still trust. Okay. But by and large, it's untrustworthy. So what do I do? Well, that's why I put that voter's guide back in the bulletin. We look at what, they, what, are, what are they trying to do? Why They're lying so hard to get these positions or, or they're, they're doing all this bad stuff to get to this position. What do they want to do when they get there? We've got to actually make the, the wisest choice that we can as citizens to vote for the person who best represents or their platform, their party, best represents my values. And then I vote for that person. What I'm saying here, watch, watch what the text says, because I, I don't want to talk just about them. I, I can take, the, the Bible is a mirror, and I can look in the mirror, and I can turn the mirror over here and say, oh, I see Bob over there. <laughs> oh, I can turn it over here and say, oh, there's my wife. <laughs> and, and, and I can look in the Word of God and start picking out the flaws in everybody else's life, right? Or I can take that mirror of the Word of God and look right in it and see my own life. The tongue also is a fire. I don't look, skip these politicians. Look in the mirror at yourself. The tongue is a fire. What am I doing with my tongue? It's evil among the body parts. <clears throat> it corrupts the whole person. Am I corrupted by my tongue and what I say? Am I speaking the truth in love? That's what Ephesians 4 says. Not simply that I, I speak the truth, but I speak the truth in love. Am I, am I speaking in such a way, or as it says in, in Ephesians 4 and other places, it says, let no corrupt communication come out of your mouth, but only that which will build up the other person. Now, we know that's not taking place in politics, so throw that stuff out of the window. But we as a community of Christians, we speak the truth in love, and we make sure that no corrupt communication comes out of our mouth, but rather what will build up the other person and make them more holy. 
He says here, it corrupts the whole person, your body, your person. It sets the whole course of his life on fire. My whole life, the whole campaign, the whole school, the whole workplace. My tongue can do a devastating thing. And the next part is, it itself is set on fire by hell. Theologians take this two different ways. When you don't control your tongue, you're worthy to go to hell. One. The other way is that hell itself is, is, is somehow taking control of you through demonic powers. And that's where its source is coming with. You are not aligning yourself with Christ. You're aligning yourself with the gates of hell that are trying to overcome the church. Either way, it's not good. It's not good. The spark metaphor. The next fourth one is the snake. <laughs> he goes out, he says, all kinds of animals. He says, birds and reptiles and creatures of the sea are being tamed and have been tamed by man. Look at that. They've been tamed by man. But, here's the thing. Both of them, the fire. I can use fire. In fact, we have a fireplace and we run a fire, well, probably now till spring, we'll be running one sometime every day. Fire in the fireplace is a good thing. If the fire gets in the curtains, <laughs> it's a bad thing. All right? So I have tamed the fire to use it to my advantage. The snake enchanter tames the snake so he can make a buck, a profit off of it, right? The whole thing is, they've both been tamed. But listen to what the Bible says. But no man can tame the tongue. This just drives me crazy. I'm your pastor. My tongue is not tamed. That's what the Bible says. Billy Graham, Franklin Graham, the Pope, I don't care who it is. Their, tame, their tongue is not tamed. That's what this text says. No man can tame his own tongue. It's a restless evil full of deadly poison. Both the Old Testament and New Testament says the poison of asp is behind the lips, the tongue. It's poisonous. If that's the case, I mean, I've got this, it's only the Jesus-controlled tongue that is tamed. When it's Jesus in my heart, coming out of my mouth, he's the one that controls my tongue. So I have got to set Jesus as Lord in my life so that he controls my tongue. Here's the antidote. Let your conversation always be full of grace. Grace means giving the gift, giving a gift to someone who doesn't deserve it. You're working with somebody and they're mean and nasty to you, you, you just could be as gracious and kind and nice to them. There's a student that's bullied, you just got to be gracious and nice and kind to them. You, you, it says seasoned with salt. You use salt to preserve and add flavor. You make your language as pleasant and positive and wonderful as it possibly can be. So that you may know how to answer everyone, add this little bit on there, in a winsome fashion. You never win anybody over just from argumenting. Just an argument, you've got great arguments and... You've got to win their heart before you win their mind. And once you win their heart, they'll allow you into their mind. And so he's saying here, you've got to season your speech with the salt of God's grace so that you win people as a friend before you try to win them to your position. Listen, the last one here is the disrespectful this, this, this tongue. And the metaphor here is of water. Can both fresh water, life-giving water, and salt water, you can't drink salt water. You, you drink salt water and your days are numbered, okay? He said, fresh water? I got salt water here. I got a tsunami. <laughs> the life-giving and the life-killing. That's, that's the whole picture. Can they both come out of the same spring? The answer is no. You can't have fresh water and salt water coming out of the same one because the salt water will pollute the fresh water. It's just the way it is. If you put fresh water into the salt water, you'll dilute it, but it'll still be salt water. You, you can't, they can't, can't do it. And he says, my brothers, listen, can a fig tree bear olives? No. 
or a grape bear figs? No. Fig trees give figs. Vines give grapes. It doesn't, doesn't work that way. Then he says, neither can a salt spring produce fresh water. When the tongue, he says, so here's the point he wants to make. With the tongue, we praise the Lord. We came in and we sang these wonderful songs today. Weren't they, weren't they great? Wasn't that a great time of singing? With our, with our tongues, we lift up our voice and we praise God from whom all blessings flow. Isn't that what we do? We're praising God. And with it, we curse that guy that cut us off. And then he adds this, who's been made in God's likeness. Oh, I praise God, but somebody that's in God's likeness, I curse him. What he's really saying is, I'm attacking God when I attack that other person who's made in the image and likeness of God. How can I do both? How can I have praise and cursing coming out of the same source and saying, in my heart is Jesus? How can I do that? That's why he says, listen, if you can tame that tongue, you're a perfect man. The only one that can tame that tongue is Jesus. You've got to have Jesus in your heart. And he's got to be ruling in your heart. And he's got to be reigning in your heart. He's got to be the one that is motivating you, motivating you from the heart. Out of the same mouth come praise and cursings, my brother. And he says, this should not be. This should not be. So then what should be? Good question. I'm suggesting here from this little book of James that he's saying you need a dynamic faith. You need a faith that actually works so that Christ is the one who is holding the bridle on my tongue. Christ is the one who's actually piloting my ship. Christ is the one who's actually blazing with a renewal fire within my heart. He's renewing me day by day. That Christ is the one who's taming my tongue. It is Christ who's the one who's purifying my water. He is the one who prunes the vines so that I bear forth much fruit. Our speech will be seasoned with salt when Christ is control of my life. When he's in my heart, he's reigning and controlling. Only then, only then, when that's happening... Will we control our tongues and also control ourselves in every other way, as it says in James 3 2? Only then, when Christ is in control. I want to leave you with 12 words that bring blessings. You all know these. Please, thank you. I notice I never get criticized for saying please, and nobody ever criticizes me for saying thank you. It's kind of universal. Please, thank you. How about I'm sorry? I get criticized for that sometimes. And when I say I'm sorry, and person says, oh, no, you're not. You're just saying that. So I've got to say it convincingly, right? Genuinely from the heart. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I love you. I love you. That's another one that's got to come across that you are convincing the person from your heart. It's got to be real, genuine, transparent. It's hard to argue with somebody who loves you, who's saying they love you. Very hard. One more, I'm praying for you. I'm praying for you. Again, it's got to be said in the right way. It could be, well, you're all messed up. I'm going to pray for you. That's not going to work. It's not going to work. But when you say, you know, my heart really feels for you, can we pause for a moment and pray? Well, I'll tell you what, that might be too intimidating. I'm going to be praying for you. How can they argue with that? These are words of blessings. There's more. But out of my mouth should not come cursings. Out of my mouth should come blessings. Do you agree? Amen. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we are asking that the Holy Spirit and the Spirit of Christ, the Lord Jesus himself, who resides in our hearts, would take such control that when my tongue speaks, it speaks out of my heart from Jesus so that blessings are on my lips and not cursing, that I manifest the faith of the true and living God. Others will see it and fear and trust in the Lord. Others will see it and ask for the reason of hope that I have, that I respond in such a way. Then I can just tell them I have Jesus in my heart. And you will be glorified. 
Lord, I know it takes a great faith. Great faith, genuine, real faith to control the tongue. Grant us such faith. In Jesus' name, amen. I just want to ask you this question. Perhaps God spoke to you today about your tongue. And you say, Pastor, I made a decision today that I'm going to enthrone the Lord in my heart to take control of my tongue. And you say, just pray that God will give me the strength to do that. Just lift up your hand. I'll see it. Yes, 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 yes. Let's pray. Father in heaven, I ask that you would consecrate us and our lips, our tongues, that we might give messages of blessing for you that come from a heart where Jesus reigns and rules, that he is enthroned as king. May your spirit prod us so that we say those things that bring glory and honor to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Bless these who have raised their hand to say, Lord, change my tongue, change my life through Jesus Christ, my Lord. It's in his name I pray, amen. amen. Have a wonderful Lord's Day. God bless you.